Have you heard of periodization in relation to training? It sounds quite fancy, right? Well, it's actually a logical approach to getting fitter and stronger. And I'm going to explore exactly how it works and how we can implement it into our own training plans. In very general terms, periodization works on the concept of overload and adaptation. So for athletes, I'll have a period of working really hard, having some recovery, stressing the body again in this pattern, and this will allow athletes to get fitter. Now, there are two versions of this, as traditional, and block but if you bear in mind that block periodization was introduced in around the 80s and 90s it gives you an idea of just how dated the traditional form is but that's not to say we can't learn from that and in actual fact it will suit certain athletes at certain points in their career we're going to start off by taking a look at this older version It's an old school approach that involves a large and very general preparation phase that then heads into that more race specific phase as you get closer to the main goal. And you could kind of liken this to a typical base training phase that most endurance athletes would actually use in their training. The primary idea behind traditional sequenced periodization is to prepare an athlete for a major peak during their training cycle. In this model, athletes will complete large volumes of less specific training before an event specific block followed then by a taper. Well, as you might expect, this does come with a few limitations. So to start with, if you're doing just one big block and you're tapering and peaking for one race, well, you're only gonna be in the best condition for that one event. And if you've got several events throughout the year, you're gonna to have to compete in those when you're not in that prime condition. And then because these blocks are so long, they're gonna be quite samey. So it can lead to boredom and maybe losing your focus. And also your body to get stronger and fitter does need new stimuli to kind of keep it developing in that sense. And the final one, and probably the most important downside if you are a summer sport athlete, is the fact that you're gonna to have to do that long, big block of all those miles in the winter when you're not gonna have as many daylight hours, the weather's not gonna be so nice, and it's just basically not very desirable. Well, you've probably guessed that block periodization is preferable. It can cancel out pretty much any of the downsides of traditional periodization. And it came about, like I said, in the 80s and 90s, because sports started to get more commercialized, there were more events happening and more at stake for the athletes performing at them. So block periodization actually allowed athletes to peak at sort of top level several times throughout the season. So block periodization features smaller, more focused training cycles as opposed to the sort of one long or two long training meso cycles found in traditional periodization. Well, this allows for greater customization depending on the athlete's calendar and the ability to program for multiple peaks within the year. So the smaller training blocks keep things fun and engaging for the athlete and also help prevent burnout. But let's take a look at how it actually works and in simple terms, it's broken down into three phases. Accumulation, this is the longest of the three phases and it makes up those base miles, which I expect you're familiar with. So it can be anything between two to six weeks of aerobic training and it's the longest block, but it also has the longest residual effect. So the work you do now will actually carry over through the next two phases, which is essential if you are a long distance endurance athlete. Next phase is transmutation, or it has some other names as well, but this is where the more race specific work takes place. And it's gonna be harder, but it's a shorter block, normally between two to four weeks. And you're going to be working at a much higher intensity, but on the plus side, you're gonna see a quicker transformation in your actual output. Now, with it being much harder, these sessions are gonna be putting more stress on the body. So it's vital that you're aware of those signs of overtraining and you make sure you don't edge into that. So good nutrition and really good sleep hygiene are gonna be essential to prevent that happening, but also to optimize your capacity for improving your strength and your fitness. And then you've got realization. It's the time that most athletes dream of. You're either leading into a race or you're simply recovering and you're allowing your body to physically absorb all of that training it's done and start to recover. It's when the adaptations become realized. And it needs to be considerably shorter than the previous two phases, somewhere between one to two weeks, depending on how hard the previous phases have been and what the imminent goal is. 
and an amount of high intensity and race pace work needs to be balanced with plenty of rest and recuperation. It can take a bit of trial and error to find the correct ratio for your body. Remember, other life stresses can reduce your recovery without you even noticing them at the time. Well, these three phases work together in the order that we've covered to make one block. And if you've done the maths, you'll realize that a block can be anything between five and 10 weeks. And this will allow you to have several blocks or several phases throughout a season. And you can adapt or change each block depending on the emphasis and what your overall goal is. So with all of that, I expect I've probably sold block periodization to you. You know, it is the system that we usually see in place, but there are a few limitations that it's worth being aware of. As you've probably gathered, it's more of a complex training plan. As a result, if you're not careful, you can end up making too many changes or trying to fit too much into a short period and not actually getting the most out of any particular phase. So it therefore takes a little longer to plan and make sure you fit your races in with your training, complementing them. When done well, it'll suit athletes who are used to competing and understand their bodies. However, it's not always the best approach for a beginner athlete as it can be a little unnecessarily complicated. Coaching is an art and there are so many factors to be considered when you're putting together a training program. And then take that to triathlon and you've got three sports to add into the mix, well, it's another level. There's also several factors that need to be considered from athlete to athlete. You've got the length and timings of these phases, which will vary depending on the athlete's experience and their ability to tolerate the workload. The amount of training itself and the body's ability to adapt and recover are factors that need to be considered too. Then there's the races themselves. How many races do you want to peak for in a season? What length are these races? And as a result, what intensity will you be working at for the majority of that race? I think you can start to see why we can't stand here and make a prescription training plan that would suit all of your needs. So I think after all that, you can see why it's really not possible to put together a really prescriptive training program that would suit every single person's needs. I'm going to finish off by throwing you a curveball. There's also something called reverse periodization. So kind of think about what we've talked about and flip it, basically. It's looking at doing the more intense work earlier on, followed by the more aerobic work. But that tends to be in a big block. So maybe if you are a summer athlete and you're competing when it's much longer daylight hours and you've got nasty winter, you can do shorter, more intense work then and then go into the longer miles as the weather and the daylight hours get longer. But that's a very basic kind of explanation of it. If you do want to know more about reverse periodization, then let us know in the comment section below and we could potentially look at doing a video on that topic alone. It's been quite sciencey, I'm aware of that today, but hopefully you're still with me and you've enjoyed it and it, it's helped to explain, maybe if you follow a training program, why it looks like it does. And if you've enjoyed it, remember, please give us a like and you can follow us on social media and you can also subscribe on YouTube.